lavish to the day that I die. Spring has thawed out the long bitter weather. The water is clear and the skies are blue. I'm standing in the middle of the Beaver Kill River. Might even catch and release one too. Well, some folks like horses, some cats or dogs. With a rod and a fly Yes, fishing is a favorite pastime of mine If I couldn't do it I think I would cry Well, life is good When I'm wading a river It gets even better When I cast a fly If I catch a trout It don't really matter It's fun just to be here And give it a try That's all, folks. Hey, folks, how you doing today? Curtis Mayfly here for Riffles and Waves. This is show number four. And today, uh, I believe I'm going to do a hare's ear nymph. It's a gold-ribbed hare's ear, by the way. And it's a good fly for you to learn at this stage. You're getting started into fly tying. This is an all-around fly. There's guys that have been fishing all their life. They still use a hare's ear, gold-ribbed hare's ear, every time they go fishing. Uh, there's a lot of guys that are just nymph fishermen. Um, and dry fly is just, when, when dry flies are out, they're fishing them. But there's guys that go fishing, uh, and like 95% of the fishing is subsurface. So why wouldn't you go nymph fishing? So anyway... Let's, let's uh, get into this today. Um, I'm going to use a size 12 hook, I think. It's a nymph hook. It's heavy steel. It's, uh, um, you know, it's a heavier hook than normal. And we're going to be using some material from a hair's mask. This is a hair's mask. And uh, there's all kinds of good fluff on here. 
and uh, dubbing type material and there's all kinds of different colors so you can you can really go crazy with these as, as far as we want to do. I'm going to make a wing case with some turkey quill. This has been lacquered with head cement so it's kind of uh, stiff and we're going to use that as a wing case. Uh, if you've ever looked at a nymph they have a wing case and that's when they hatch as an adult that's where their wings will fold out of. And what else? Oh, I got some gold ribbing material here. So, um, let's get started with the hare's ear nymph. Here we go. I'm going to place my hook in the vise and carefully uh, clamp it down. You want the hook to be kind of level and you don't want to break the barb. So you put it right at the base of the bottom of the bend. Now you always got to be careful when you're wrapping your thread that you don't catch that hook. That hook is extremely sharp and will very easily cut your thread. Now I'm going to wrap my thread on and go back to the bend. Okay. Now this is also the time where if you wanted to add weight to this fly, you would add some weight to this. I'm not going to do that today. Um, but you could, of course, at any time and add some weight to this. And uh, when you do that, you would wrap thread continually over that uh, uh, material, the weight weighted material to uh, make it nice and tight and make it a nice body. Okay, so we're, we're wrapped on back to the bend. Now, this is where I'm going to take some of my hair's air material. I'm going to pick out some of these longer guard hairs for the tail. So I have to come up with some kind of a tail out of all this fluff here. And here's some real nice long ones. Trim way down near the base. And I'm going to save all this fluff. Okay, All this fluff is good dubbing here. So I'm going to put that in my little cup off to the side here and save that material. All I want right now is to tie it, make a tail. So I'm going to pull the fluff out of there and you can use your your scissors as a comb in a, in, a, in a sense and get the fluff out of that base. That's all that's what keeps the rabbit warm there is that fluff creates an airspace and we don't want much of an airspace because we want this fly to sink. So the tail should be about the size of the gap so I'm going to pinch that where where I want to measure it then I'm going to pinch it with my left hand okay I'm going to trim some of this off because I don't need all that on there. Okay, so now I'm going to do the pinch method again. This is where I pinch the material in place, bring the thread up through my fingers, and then pull up on the other side, and then pull up. This prevents it from spinning around the hook. And once you get it on there, you're pretty much all set. So now I'm going to wrap that. It's nice and tight. We got a little tail on there. It doesn't have to be a big tail. Just a little, little tail, just a little uh, material there. A lot of these have two tails or three tails, and they're very short in their nymphal stage. So we've got a little bit of a tail on there, okay? Now we're going to put some uh, ribbing material. This is really fine gold ribbing. I don't like to use too thick of uh, uh, material for this. So we're going to pinch that on and wrap it, and then... Make sure it's nice and tight. Come back to the bend. And we're good. Now we need to create some dubbing. I want mine to be uh, a little bit kind of lightish. So we're going to pull some of this fuzz out of here, as you see right there. And I have my cup here, and I'm going to put it in there, and I'm going to mix all these different colors together here. And the way you do that is just take them and pull them. Now some people will use a coffee blender. Um, you don't want to use it for coffee. Uh, if you're going to use it to blend fur, just use it to blend fur. And that does a real good job at mixing the colors and blending. And that's what a lot of professional fly tires do is they blend their own colors. Okay, So they get the exact color they want for their flies. So once this is all pulled and mixed and blended, uh, we've got a nice, nice bunch of material right there. And I'm going to just take and pull a little bit out. Now, it, um, 
A lot of people will use wax on their flies or on the thread to do dubbing, but you don't really need to do that. All you need to do is get it on there and spin it a little bit, okay? Pull a little bit out, spin it on there, and it spins on pretty good. And you can always get your fingers wet with your tongue and spin the material on there if you want it a little tighter like that. But we're going to put a nice, nice bunch on there because we want this to be nice and fluffy. Okay, so we got some dubbing on there. I'm just going to wrap that around the hook. Okay, there's our abdomen. Now we get up to here. This is our thorax where our thorax starts. Okay, so I'm done with the dubbing for now. Now what I need to do is wrap my gold colored tinsel forward over that body and again we're going to palmer it. Whoop, I just broke it. Damn it. Oh, there it is. It's really hard to see this. without my magnifying glass. So I'm going to wrap this. Oh, I know what I did. I caught the hook is what I did. And this is a really fine material. So I'm going to wrap that forward. It just gives a little sparkle to that body. Okay. Now I need a little bit of turkey quill. For the wing case. I'm just going to trim that off nice and neat. I'm going to put that on top of the hook, hold it with my thumb and wrap around and pull up. Wrap around, pull up. I'm going to tie back down the body a little ways, okay, because that's where I want my thorax to really start, is right, right about in there. Now I'm going to take some more dubbing. And the thorax can be a little beefier than the abdomen, so I'm not worried about uh, having too much on here. I want a lot, and I want it to be ugly. I want it to be bulky. And there we go. So now I come to the head, and I'm going to pull my wing case over the top, hold it with my finger, wrap around, and tie it off. Pull that up, trim that, and for this I will do a what's called a half hitch. I will use this hole in the back of my uh, bo uh, bodkin, and I will go once around it, put it over the eye, and keep keep the line tight because it'll all fall apart if you don't. And just do a couple of half hitches. There's a, a gold ribbed hairs here. A good fly for you to learn how to tie. You can add weight to this. You can also add a bead head on the front. And I may show you how to do that in later shows, uh, but we'll see. We got a lot of stuff to get going here. Um, now, that's the gold ribbed hair's ear. Now, I hope all you, you will get uh, some materials together and get your fly tying kit going and your vise out and, and practice tying these flies. This is a great fly to use. Uh, you can use this in tandem with another fly and a little dropper uh, type technique. And it's very effective fly for early season all the way through the summer and all the way through the fall. This is a, a great all around fly. You can't tie enough of these. Now, um, it behooves you to also tie in different sizes. 18s to maybe 14s or 16s and down to 10s and even 8s maybe. 
um, a stonefly pattern in a size 8 nymph is a, is a, it's a big, big nymph, but uh, um, you can just tie this in black and you have a stonefly, basically. So the techniques we covered here, we, the pinch method, um, palmering, we palmered the rib over the body, we tied in a wing case on the top, um, and we did dubbing. And we even blended our own dubbing using the hare's ear mask. Now, um, I want you to try it. So get your, uh, your fly tying kit out and tie some of these. And tie them in different sizes and different colors. Uh, you can tie these in a, in a cream, lighter color. You can tie them in a dark color. Uh, you don't have to necessarily use the hare's ear mask for the dubbing. You can use any type of dubbing you want. I got beaver and all kinds of stuff here. So get out and tie some uh, hare's ear nymphs and uh, get out there on the stream in the spring. Next week we're going to do a light Cahill and we may do a light Cahill parachute which is uh, a great fly um, in the summertime down on the Delaware. So uh, join me next week as we get into the fly tying season and again I want to remind you that uh, um, as these shows progress, uh, spring is getting near. Now you're going to want to keep that in mind because as spring gets near, that means the summer gets near. Next summer, uh, the New York State Council of Trout Unlimited is hosting a fly fishing youth camp for kids 14 to 17, and they must be 14 or 17 at the time they fill out the application. Uh, the cost is $300. We're only taking 12 kids, okay? So this is important. You want to make sure you go to the website, my website, and you'll see a link there that says Trout Waters Youth Camp. Click on that link. You'll go to another website, and you'll see um, there's a camp schedule there. There's a PDF application file, and there's a, a bunch of videos to help you learn and, and learn more about the fly fishing youth camps that Trout Unlimited puts on. These are basically sponsored in part by TU National because they know that if we teach the next generation, which is you folks out there, uh, the younger folks out there, if we teach you about fly fishing and teach you all the skills needed to become a good fly fisher, you will be involved in the environment. Uh, it just goes with fly fishing. You get out there and experience the environment like I have and many other folks in uh, the fly fishing world have, you, you become concerned about problems you see on the stream or degradation of the land and farm, poor farming practices and things like that. So um, this camp is very important. We need to teach the next generation of stewards out there to protect these cold water resources so they'll still be here uh, when I no longer can. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm old, but I'm, I'm getting up there. And another 20 years or so, I won't be able to do all the environmental activism that I do. Uh, so I need, I need you to get in there. Now, we only take 12 kids to this camp. The cost is $300. And, uh, but what you, what you need to do is go on to my website and find that link for Trout Waters Youth Camp and then get into uh, the application and read the application. You don't send any money uh, when you fill out the application. You have to be selected first. We have a very strict kind of guidelines there. And what you need to do is you're going to write an essay as to why you want to learn how to fly fish. And you're going to explain to us what conservation means to you. And you're going to provide us with a uh, a teacher or a counselor, a science teacher that, that you had last year, somebody who knows you really well and can speak on your behalf. Because I will call them and talk to them personally as to what kind of student you are. So uh, we're looking for the best of the best. Now, it's not going to be an English exam. We're not going to grade you on your English and uh, your spelling and, and grammar and so forth. What we want to see is what's in your heart. So we want the essay from you in your own words, and we'll read between the lines. We know, okay? We're, the people on the selection committee are all fine fly fishers and have experienced uh, life from a fly fishing angle. 
So they know. So you just write us a good essay as to why you want to learn fly fishing and conservation. And uh, again, go to my website and find that link if you're interested in learning how to be, become a great fly fisher. It's a week-long adventure. It'll be in July, so regions are over. We'll be fishing the West Branch and the East Branch exclusively in different places. And there's classes all different. Look at the schedule. It's online. So anyway, we just did the Hare's Ear Nymph. And I guess we'll see you next week. Uh, uh, and we'll be doing a light Cahill. All righty? Take care now. Hi, welcome to today's show. I'm Ted Need and I'm an avid ice fisherman. I'm also have been in the retail industry for over five years. Today's show I'm gonna go over all aspects of ice fishing from clothing to different gear, and tomorrow when we're on the water, we're gonna go over different techniques to use. I'm gonna start with clothing. I'm gonna start at the feet and work to the head. An important thing to consider is synthetic fabrics such as nylon or polyester, wick moisture, and also are warm even when wet. A material such as cotton is extremely warm, but when it gets wet, it loses its warmth and the water stays on the skin as compared to nylon or synthetic fabrics or fabrics that wick or remove moisture from the skin will remain warm when wet and also will keep you dry. I'm going to start with the feet. There's several different styles of boots you can get. I found out that uh, boots with 800 to 1,000 grams of insulation work well for me. This will be different for different people, so you have to experiment with what works well for you. Also, when looking at a boot, I look for, I want it to be waterproof. Gore-Tex or breathable material is the best because when drenched, it's, your feet still remain, even if your leather or nylon is completely drenched. This boot, for example, is over 1,000 grams of, grams of insulation. If you look at it, it a, has a has thick tread or a deep sole. And also, when you look at it, it's a higher boot. It has leather on the exterior, which is highly durable or extremely durable. And also, it's waterproof. Another good feature of this boot is it has a lining inside. I don't know if you can see that, but that helps keep your feet warm also. But the a drop at, uh, advantage of this is it's extremely warm. A disadvantage is if you're walking long distances to get to your ice holes, is an extremely stiff boot. If you look at it, the boot doesn't flex much, and the disadvantage is that if you're walking long distances, you'll get fatigued and become tired at the end of the day. But if you're going on a snowmobile or you're getting out of the car and going, this is a very good boot. It's one of the warmest boots on the market. The one thing I've noticed though when I've used these boots, if I'm walking half a mile or a long distance down the lake, I tend to be at the back of the pack and my stride is not natural. This boot seems to solve this problem. It's not quite as warm, but it's a hunting boot. And if you look at it, I can bend it within itself. So if I'm walking long distances, it's like walking in a slipper, extremely comfortable. This boot also, another advantage of it, it's Gore-Tex. It has a lining inside so that it doesn't have to have as thick of a lining for waterproofing. The next area I'll go over, now that I've gone over boots, is your socks to wear. Like I stated earlier, you're going to want to go with a polyester wicking liner sock, as seen here. It's a very thin sock. This one is wool, for example, and this repels moisture from your skin because a big problem you have when you get cold is that moisture stays on your skin and cools your skin which when you sweat, it's good in the summer, but during the winter time, 
you want to remain dry and warm. So this is a wicking material, so it releases moisture from the skin to the outer layers. The next uh, sack you use is a, is a sack for warmth. This is a wool sack. Um, it's a merino wool, which if you're sensitive to wool or different materials, it won't, it won't itch or it won't irritate your skin. This is quite a bit thicker, if you can see it here, and that provides warmth in addition to the insulation in your boots. So I usually wear, depending on temperature, I usually wear two to three pairs of socks. For me, at any temperature, having a wool liner sock like this, for example, and a thicker wool sock works well for me. And as I said earlier, boots, I go from 800 to 1,000 grams of insulation and also have Gore-Tex or a waterproof boot so my feet don't get wet. And these boots are both waterproof up to the top here and they're higher boots. So if you're going through slush and water on the ice, your feet won't get wet.